Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast. This is episode 41. Uh, before we get started, the Seeds of Liberty podcast, as always, is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. So this week we are joined by Kyle Molinay, uh, the man behind Liberate RVA and uh, the recently dubbed Statist Whisperer. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for coming on, Kyle. I really appreciate uh, you giving us the time tonight. No, it's great to be on your show. Uh, I think I've been on here once already a while ago. It's, uh, I guess I have really good, consistent stuff out there. Danilo comes on the show often, right? Well, D- uh, well Danilo is a co-host on co-host, this, and yeah, you've, yeah. you've been on his show twice. Okay, okay. So his show is uh, his own thing. He just He's a co-host on this show. He started this project with us. There it goes. Yeah, I was just looking at the YouTube channel and the videos and saw it. Yeah, well, we, we share all of our videos between right, me, there you go. me and him. Yeah, and he, he, just likes to, uh, he just likes to bail on us from time to time. <laughs> his, his life is more important than getting the free message of freedom out there. We understand. Yeah, he just, um, I can't hold... come, guys. Things. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't hold it against him. Um, but uh, for those who, who don't know about you and uh, Liberate RVA, why don't you uh, give us a little background on yourself there, Cal, and uh, you know whatever you feel like sharing with our audience. Uh, sure. I would say um, background about me. Um, anarchy has been something I've been I've had an interest in since uh, 2006. Uh, before that, just I've always had an interest in anti-authoritative movements and found it difficult then, of course, growing up to find a group that was anti-authoritative. Um, eventually, that led me to an info shop in D.C., the Brian McKinsey Info Shop, which were anti-police, anti-state, and the only weird caveat is that they were also anti-capitalist. Uh, so that's <laughs> the one area. It's like, all right, I got to separate myself from that. Um, but I never heard of the term anarcho-capitalist back then. At that point, I just considered myself a libertarian anarchist because there's no other groups out there back then. So eventually, just going group after group and finding the inconsistencies and the way that people were able to bastardize their message because it was not universal, um, I gave up. I gave up after uh, Occupy. I was there for a week and I was, I was just done. And then cool. eventually, after moving here to Richmond and finally meeting good people, right? I mean, anarchy works right, in theory in the way when you, when you read it, but in the application, how can it work if you have a presumption that everyone's evil, right? You have this Hobbesian theory, right? It's like, well, and then it's not really worth it. But of course, Moving here to Richmond changed all that for me. I actually met really good-hearted people. And then having that experience here is what led me to be, well, if people are good, then then this can happen. Uh, and that's what drove me to have the initiative to to spend the next year and a half preparing to create a Liberate RVA. And that included the uh, the rhetoric, the, the algorithm, um, and putting the, the foundations of the organization together to be the first anarchist organization that is consistent not just against state violence, not just against uh, the police violence, which is uh, synonymous with state violence, but also against the violence we do to each other, and most importantly, the violence that's done to children, right? Uh, that's that's the first government that children face when growing up their own parents, that kind of uh, anti-authoritative, just to universalize that with no exceptions, so that way it becomes troll-proof and no one can bastardize the message um, wherever they come from. And that's that's what started Liberty RVA, and that's uh, what started, I guess, the technical, I guess, foundation day was in May 2012. Right now, we're on our fourth year going, and we have over 100 anarchists here now in Richmond, and just, you know, enjoying uh, the measure of success that we've kind of grown, growing that community, growing this brotherhood of people that you can trust <laughs> with your property, that people have real respect for private property and for self ownership, uh, for the eventual transition to a free society based on consent when we either force the state to, uh, to, to be abolished or when it, it abolishes itself through natural secession. Mm. The, uh, the, uh, I had a friend, I think, just moved down there with you guys, uh, Phil. Phil, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he did a sh- uh, one, one of my shows with me uh, a while back. That guy's a real cool guy. He is a good guy. Uh, the anarchist statistician. <laughs> statistician, yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, great guy. I've, I've been friends with him for a while, and uh, he just was stopping by here in Richmond to check it out, and I uh, decided, you know what, this is this is the place. Uh, <laughs> this is it, and uh, settle down. Uh, now we do videos together here as well. Sweet, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm going to have to come up there for like a weekend or a week or something and just chill with you guys and do some videos. That'd be fun. That'd be a lot of fun. We can go spreading anarchy together. You know, wait till it's, uh, <laughs> you know. 
<coughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and outdoor philosophy doesn't mix well. I love those videos you do where you sit out there and you ask those questions. And I love your questions. They're so easy to answer. Um, you can just see the bombs go off in their heads when you ask them. When you ask them. And, you know, I, I, there was that one time the... Uh, that big that big military guy walked up and was like oh, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't let go of your hand <laughs> right and i was like this is this is going to be bad <laughs> but i was Look. like oh, i don't know cuz you were you you weren't given an inch either no no i knew exactly what he's going to say oh, of course you, we've all heard it a thousand times cal <laughs> when, when when you preface it i am a veteran i know exactly where you're going with that <laughs> Yeah, it's like when most people say I'm a taxpayer, you know, you know, cause, you know, it's coming after that when they use that as a defense. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's I, I mean, I, I guess it would be like a anarchy outreach almost, I guess, what, what you guys kind of do. Right. I mean, the, the videos I've seen of you just it's great, though, because it, it is it's just you out there talking to people and making people actually think for once, which is so, you know, I mean, you see that on the opposite end of that, you see the videos of like, uh you know, Mark Dice or, you know, even even Jay Leno with his jaywalking bit or whatever, like, you know, trying to, you know, purposely prey on the the idiocy or just plain ignorance of some people, you know, yeah. um, you're you're taking you're taking the complete opposite approach to that. And it's, it's amazing because a lot of people you would assume, um, I guess, the cynics out there who would see the, the, you know, the other those other videos and be like, oh, they can't, you know, you, you, can, you can't you can't win with people out there like that. But you really do. You just you just keep pressing along and and people it's 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 so great like i mean dave said with the bombs going off because it is some people you'll you'll what you can watch them actually walk to their own walk to the conclusions themselves right there uh it's amazing yeah i made a lot of good friends uh just just doing that uh just like day one uh just be coming to that anarchist conclusion themselves and saying this is very logical. This is, you know, okay, you know, like an engineering student once said this to me. And then uh, the next day, it's like yeah, I'm, I'm an anarchist. This makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I remember when it clicked for me. I was like, you know what? I just it makes so much sense that an idiot. I would be foolish not to accept this. That's like, and and you know, and I, I'm one of these people that, you know, like aliens could come down, and I'd still be like, I don't know. It could be a government conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. could be a like, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm not the guy like watching the the train wreck. I'm the guy over there like watching like what started the train wreck. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I don't know. Um, yeah, but I would say like most people already have these more projections to begin with. Uh, that's usually how the conversation lead into uh, asking three simple questions that reveal to me what your moral projections are. And they're very revealing. You advocate for consensual relationships. You advocate that it's wrong and immoral to initiate force. Self-defense is not violence. It's, um, it's protecting yourself from the initiation force. Right? Always drawing that distinction between the two. All right. There's a separation from defending yourself from the initiation force and the initiation of force. Um, and then from there, yeah, they agree that it's wrong and immoral to bind force their opinions onto other people. Bam! Great. You just made the moral case for anarchy. And then from there. <laughs> Uh, we draw the, I, I paint the brush and what it, what is government? And then uh, showing how leading to the end of that conclusion that it goes to the very opposite of your moral premises, right? And then you find that government just misled you, has tricked you into compromising your moral virtues and principles by supporting them. Uh, so therefore, if you want to remain consistent and moral, you must therefore um, advocate against the state, right? Yeah, 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 like you said, finding their moral compass and then explaining to them in the best way and you do it really good making them see the violence of the state because that's a thing people don't really realize they don't understand the complete violence of the state you know they, they put a gun at everybody's head and say pay up right all right so uh, though, uh Rob Grease is so a guy on a friend he uh, on a, a friend of mine on Facebook he, he uh, was out in front of uh, his campus he's a, he's a uh, philosophy uh, professor there and then he had a, a board up and it was just put a star on each one and it was should charities should private charities be able to rob from people to fund their stuff and then cor uh, corporations and charities should not be able to rob to pay for you know and like all the stars were on the should not right and then it was like would you rob to pay for a charity it was like no and then it was like 
what are taxes? <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and it was like, do you believe that taxation is okay? And there was like maybe two or three stars in the yeah. And it was like, once people realize it, it's like, I can't deny it anymore. And right. to advocate it, it makes me a crazy person. Right, yeah. I think uh, being a hypocrite could be the worst crime that anyone can commit to themselves, right, in terms of their values. Uh, for me, that's what I find. So yeah, it's, uh, it would drive them crazy to find a resolve <laughs> to reconcile those two differences. Um, so this is a friend of yours was a professor doing this yeah he was he was uh he was i i talking about socialism as well and was showing people about socialism with like school grades mm -hmm. he was like could you imagine if all of your school grades everyone just walked out with a c no matter how hard you tried what would be the outcome of how much effort you would put into the the class and they were like i wouldn't even go if i'm gonna get a c so and he and then and it was like Okay, you work at the factory. No matter what you do, you can't get fired and you're not going to get cut paid. And you're going to get paid the same. What do you do? Do you fuck off all day or do you work your ass off? <laughs> so that's why socialism fails. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Well, sure. It's just, but I mean, like you said, like you, I mean, you said, Dave, you know, once, once people have that, once they, once you make that connection, it's, it's hard to go back. The problem is getting people there. You know, I, I've watched so many people. I, I mean, I remember back to my own, um, you know, I guess transformation for lack of a better term. Um, you know, when just like that stutter step where you, 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 you almost get there and then uh, you, I guess, I don't know, for me, it was almost like a, a fear of, uh, you know, not wanting to let go completely. And just, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I, I can see how this works. And then you find that one more objection and I find so many people cling to that. I mean, I, I deal with that with a lot of the people in my own life, unfortunately. Um, it's like that, that one just, little thing that they're hung up on. Yeah, they mm -hmm. just they cling to it, and they just they they're they're willing to accept it in in just the the principle, of just just a voluntary interactions, just in general, you know, just like are they, you know, with that that question, do you believe, you know, like you said, Cal, how do you believe everything should be consensual, you know, or voluntary, however however you want to put it, and, you know, and most people will just naturally agree with that, just, of course, of course. You know, and and they can see it in every other aspect of their lives, but there's usually that one thing where they just, for some reason, they just they'll either turn a blind eye to it, or even if they've reached that point where they see it everywhere else, they'll just they'll still find a way to justify that one little thing. <laughs> I think it's uh, it I think the uh, how harsher indoctrination is, is also I think how stronger cognitive dissonance is. And I think that is a big hurdle to get over with some people, that cognitive dissonance. And it's to confront that they might be wrong in a scenario is just too, it's too much for them. I think it's mostly because there's, I mean, even if you've come to this conclusion, um, where else are you going to find anarchy, right? Anarchy exists between two people that uh, practice these uh, consensual relationships with. You come to this conclusion also by yourself out there in the middle of nowhere, uh, and so in that loneliness, you're just like, well, it sounds great, but you know, where am I going to apply this? Who else am I going to find out there to talk about this? Um, whereas when we have these conversations with people, it's like, where, where does anarchy exist? And but of course, the person is in front of you is right here, right? <laughs> you advocate against an issue, and of course, this is anarchy right here. What we have right now together, right? There's, this is consensual. Our relationship now is voluntary. Uh, that is anarchy, and that is something real that people can see. So I think the there's in which there's a hesitancy to kind of go forth is because, you know, it's like a magician trick, right? If I pull the tablecloth, you know, I'm supposed to lead you to a conclusion of the magic trick, but if I don't lead you anywhere, it's like, well, all right, that was, that was a good trick, and, you know, and that's <laughs> it, right? Uh, the leading would be to a community. The leading would be uh, to other anarchists that you can feel comfortable with, right? It's, people will feel that it's uh, suicidal to go against their tribe, right? Uh, you know, there's comfort and safety in there to believe the same thing as, as the other tribe does. It's difficult to go against the grain unless you be uh, treated harshly or differently. But if there's another group out there ready to accept you, great, you can make that transition. It doesn't have to be as difficult. Um, you, you're not the only person. And I think uh, to find these people in your community, you're going to have to, it behooves you then to be the person to be outspoken. All right, stop waiting for someone else to say the things you know that should be said. Um, and that will draw uh, other people in as well. So I'm yeah. glad you said that. Like, I've, I've been thinking about it, but I didn't want to say anything. But uh, it takes people with, with that kind of courageous uh, attitude to, to push that out there. 
draw them in because um, they're, they're in your city. They're out there too thinking the same thing, but they just don't know where to go or if anyone else is thinking the same thing. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Hey, you know, I, I, there's a Larkin video I love and it's, it's titled monitor this fascist and it's uh, from a pork fest uh, speech he gave and, you know, in the core of the speech, uh, he's basically saying to people that if you don't say this to this, to everyone, if you don't say this, they'll never hear it. They're never going to hear this contrarian opinion if you don't give it to them. So it's basically, you know, don't shut up. And all people always tell me, oh, Bell, can you please walk on eggshells around? No. <laughs> Why? Their but their jimmies get rustled, right? Yeah, I've just stopped. I've, I've stopped getting invited places because I, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. You know, I, I try to find other avenues. Um, but you're right. You're right, though. It's the whole. It's the. I mean, I, I that that's what happened to me. I you know when I first. I mean, luckily when I first started you know learning about anarchism and everything, it was it was somebody who was already most of the way down the path already that introduced me to it that was local so i at least had that one person um and then uh when, when he up and moved away um i had already started to build a little bit of at least a you know a little a little bit of a community um so that was helpful but it's it's it, it can be scary when you think you're like the only person out there and, and you're right it's, it's funny i i a while uh, it must have been like i don't know late last year early this year uh, I got an email from some random uh, neighborhood thing. Somehow, one of my neighbors had had put me on uh, put me on the list. I don't even re realize this person knew me. Um, but uh, for this, you know, online neighborhood community thing where people all get together and talk and talk about the you know the local stuff, basically like a, I guess a forum, um, but a little little more advanced than that. Um, and at first, I kind of ignored it, and I was like, I don't really want a, a part of this. But then I started to think about it, and in those terms that you were discussing, it's like. Well, this is the perfect opportunity for me to have like a little bit of a captive audience with people, you know, in my neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhoods that I wouldn't actually see on a regular basis and start to bring some of these ideas to them and uh, see where I can take it. And uh, maybe, you know, maybe try to invite them to, to come out to a, a more public gathering so we can talk about it and stuff like that, because, uh, you know, you know, you guys are right. If, if we don't talk, you know, if we don't talk about it. Um, it doesn't go very far and you know, it's, it's nice to have this these connections on social media and stuff But a lot of these Groups and all these other things just end up turning into echo chambers and you're not really getting very far um, I mean, it's, it's nice to feel to be part of something I guess um, At least for me again, you know not feeling alone anymore and having other people out there But aside from that, it's like you actually have to go th out there and do it I mean, I, I preach all the time that you got to kind of live it too Which is you know, I'm sure a big part of what you guys are doing down there um, in Richmond, um, you know, that's what I try to do with my, my, with my business up here. I, I started, I started discussing these ideas with my clients a lot more. I started being a lot more open with it. I started taking my business in a more agorist route and trying to just, and trying to show just, you know, just show people that, Hey, it's stuff like this. It's possible. You can do it. You know, you, you have to put a little more work into it for now because there's these, the state is an obstacle in your way at almost all times, but you know, cause just telling people, Oh yeah. Cause a lot of people. I, the, the, the mo one of the most common responses I get, um, which is not even an acceptance, it's it's almost it's still more of a dismissal. It's yeah, that sounds great on paper, but we we you know we live in the real world and yada 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 and however however they want to end that that line of thought. Um, but that's like that's a very common criticism. They, they basically they're basically telling you yes I agree, um, yes I see the, I see the theft I see the violence. <laughs> But, I don't uh, see a pragmatic solution to gonna, your. Yeah, yeah, what are we gonna do about it? It's like it's like, oh, oh, like those people are the, some some of the worst at all. I'm, I'm actually. I always say it's not what we're gonna do about it, or we, or what. It's what are you gonna do about it? Sure. So what are you gonna do about it? I, I ask them. Yeah, I mean, the, the only kind of liberty you can kind of push forward is personal liberty, right? Individual liberty. Uh, you can help other people in that community to help further unplug. Right from the matrix and the areas that they find themselves in when they come to anarchy, um, and that we part would be that community safety. Right, that's 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 what we're going to do about it. You know, keep growing our <laughs> growing our tribe. Right, eventually, how we're going to take you know the, the how we have to be organized. This is our enemies are organized against us. Um, inevitably, we're going to have to contend with the prison wardens of our tax farms. 
uh, but you can't do that now. <laughs> you can't do this individually. Uh, one by one, they'll you know, take you off like ants, um, but as you kind of group up and get a large enough uh, tribe, eventually you can do something about it. Eventually you can, eventually, uh, like I guess one of the eventual goals here in Richmond will be to get at least uh, five to 10% of uh, the populations to be anarchists and to eventually all together uh, stop giving into the fear of what happens if you don't pay your extortion taxes right, to the IRS. Uh, you can up your withholding tax, for example, and that would uh, help drive up uh, the, the lack of, uh, I guess, supply oxygen that government needs to continue to fund their monopolies uh, throughout the entire year. Uh, you could think, uh, whose father is that? Um, Milton Friedman for the withholding tax, his greatest sin, his greatest regret. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do right now to get ready for that transition, to get ready for the phase, and building up that community is, is the way out of here. So you can either force the state's hand when you gather enough size to all together not give into that fear and all together start re re protecting each other's property um, and that will force the, the local state to collapse immediately and now we've already we've accomplished that now we can move in towards that transition and you don't have to convince all of richmond you know everyone else will follow this that bandwagon effect where three percent of the people in the american revolution that's all it took and of course um when you have like incidents like the bunny ranch when we're protecting private property, you know, the moral argument trumps everything else, right? At least that's something that people can see in that, and people will come uh, to protect that. But by that time, it would be too late. By that time, uh, <laughs> this, this will spread out there like wildfire for everyone else to follow. Uh, it just takes one one city to do it, one large enough community to go all the way and without any compromise. You make a compromise, you make an exception for political rulers and politics, and it just repeats all over again, and then the matrix just reboots. So you have to be consistent. You have to draw, get all the local champions of liberty and to push that forward. Maybe it'll take here 15, 20 years, but that's our measure of success already right now. Over 100 end caps and just kind of pushing it forward and forward and forward. That's the inevitability. That or you just wait until natural secession occurs. At least then we're ready for that transition as well. So plan well, A if, if a if the federal government allows, like, let's say, Texas to secede, and Texas then forms its own corporate government or whatever you want to call it. Um, that makes the case for individual secession because if you can secede from the empire, essentially, that shouldn't be just based to another ruling class, essentially. I don't know that that'll, that'll work. I mean, we've already had a lot of empires that collapse naturally through secession, and none of that. I think to, Texas is going to secede. None, I, I, none I, of I, that I, ever led to individual secession, yeah, right? No. If there's no tribe large enough advocating completely, um, then it's not going to happen. The tribe in uh, Texas are, are, are have been misled into still thinking to just redoing the same thing. So that's never going to lead to individual secession unless there's a good group of anarchists there pushing for individual secession. Well, you know, it's funny. Texas has some of the worst gun laws in, in the country. I know that sounds crazy, but they have some really shitty ones. But they have the most gun ownership in the America per person. And uh, I, I just don't know. Like, I, I People don't understand that every gun law on the books, legitimately, every gun law on the books is straight, is treasonous and should be dealt as such. I don't understand how people sit by idly and let that. That's that one of. That is one of the reasons I am an anarchist to it's this today. Well, I'd, I'd say it's purportedly treasonous because doesn't that doesn't that kind of go run counter to your normal thing that everything the the, go, the government does is constitutional? Of course, but <laughs> right. Yeah, um, I mean, this is me slipping back well, into reasons well, why I'm not a statist anymore. I would just, hmm. I would just say it's funny because you know when you when you first said about. Dave, when you when you made the trying to make the point about you know if Texas seceded, it makes the case for individual secession. I mean, I, I that was that was the case Rothbard was trying to make that I believe that if if the the Civil South War. had been allowed to secede, you know, quote unquote allowed to secede from the Union, um, you know, before this before the war between the states, uh, the uh, that would have been that would have made the case, but Cal, you make an interesting point there. I, I hadn't I hadn't even thought of that. The fact that most nations are were ended up built out of some form of secession or another, um, and it never has made the case before. Why would have that? In, why would that individual case have been different exactly? It, that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I think, uh, you know, if if whatever if Texas, if Texas was able to do it, I think Vermont talked about doing it for a while. Even if that 
small section of California slash Oregon. What is it? The state of Jefferson. Um, you know, like like you said, Cal, they they still have the wrong mindset. You know, they right. want to they want to secede, but they want to have just a, they just want to replace the government with a different government. Right. Um, I think starting from the ground up, uh, the way you the way you're talking about is actually a a much better. It, it makes it makes a lot more sense, and it's something I've I've thought about here, and I've I've tried to. I've tried to get things started, but here on you know on Long Island where I am, I'm, I'm heavily outnumbered. Um, but uh, but the idea I think is is better because you know the the whole what you said about the you know the three percent. It's so funny. So many of the uh, the the so-called three percenters out there run around and throwing that number out, but they don't realize yeah. what it actually means. That like right. yeah, <laughs> in, in today what's that in today's terms? What's that nine million? Is that what three percent is? Right? right or is it nine? Right? Yeah. Um, you'd only need you know I, I usually say ten to fifteen million tops doing exactly what you're talking about because i you know the, the quickest way to end any of these laws or any of the stuff that we find oppressive or unbearable or, or just straight up immoral um is to make it unenforceable and stop how you, paying <laughs> well yeah but but like but like cal said you know if just one person does it here one person does it there one yeah you might you know you might get away with it for a while you might you know or they may single you out right away and try to make an example of you but you run that risk because it's easy to pick people off when it's just these single entities um you know but that's something that's actually something i'm trying to plant the seeds with with the the neighborhood community i was talking about earlier um about trying to get rid of the property tag to do exactly that try to get a large enough group of people in this area to figure out what a what a scam property taxes are and try to get that about it, try to get everybody to rail against that and see if we can just say no don't 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 call your don't call your congressman your senator your local person whatever no let's just band together and we're just going to say no because what do they do then you know they either try to force their you know force the hand and uh, th in this day and age where everything would be recorded by, you know, 15 million different people just with their phones alone, um, you know, it's OK. You want you want it. You want to take it to the extreme or do you want to back down because you don't want this to become a thing everywhere else and try to, you know, quiet it somewhere somewhere else? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If they fight it, then that it goes viral. Yeah. Right. And, and that's what they did. They backed down at the Bundy Ranch. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that's that's a natural argument that we have to. Oh, well, the, and then they declared the Bundy family ter a terrorist organization now. Yeah, of course, of course. Oh, there's yeah. yeah, and they're still watching those people. My my dad was one of them. My dad, my dad was out there. He was, you know, he has pictures with him and Cliven and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, unfortunately, with that with that group, there was a lot of them that were very still misguided. Right, um, right, right, right. Because they 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 saw the win, as it were not not necessarily just for freedom they saw it as a win for you know freedom their style of freedom via the constitution that was the it's happening if that right. shit would have broke down it would have started everywhere like they knew that they had to stop that shit because that was on news 24 7 if that would have broke down everybody watching that would have been like well boys i guess it's fucking happening all right uh, but when you no longer have a steady supply chain of oxygen going to the body, you know, it'll you know, asphyxiate and die, right? So if we all get together and stop giving to the fear, what happens if you don't give up these extortion money to the IRS or to local government, they will asphyxiate and die and, sh and shrivel up. Then there's nobody to go after you. There's no one to pay to go after you. There's no one going to come to your property uh, after that notion. Uh, and that will set a path for everyone else to kind of follow suit as well. Um, but of course, you already have a group of people just in case, uh, you know, plan B, but I doubt it'll, it'll occur at that point. At that point, it'll be too late. At that point, the message is consistent or there's no advocation. You can just check out the website. Nowhere on there will you see anything about a constitutionalism, <laughs> anything about a political ruler or parties. Uh, you can't sway it, right? It's universal. All you, you'll find is um, talking about peaceful parenting, uh, things about, uh, you know, consent. Uh, the, the, the terms will be well carefully defined and no uh, areas in which you can kind of, I guess, derive a meaning to mean otherwise, right? There's no advocation for the initiation of force. Um, so there's no way you can spin it in any other direction. More attention giving it to it will just draw more attention to these ideas. Yeah, that's the scary thing. And that's, you know, people are like, don't you worry about the government hearing what you say? I'm like, no, I want, if every government agent in the country could hear what I say right now, 
I would be okay with that. Seriously. <laughs> because I'm going to get through to a few of them. It's going to happen. So yeah, yeah I'd imagine monitor I'd... me. I don't care. Right, right, I don't right. care. Yeah. I'd imagine I'm probably the, uh, the most lamest person to kind of monitor. Like, there he goes again. Talk about peace of parenting. There he <laughs> goes again. <laughs> Voluntary solutions. All right, oh go. gosh. He's debating on <laughs> Facebook again for two hours. No, I'll try to avoid that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. We all try to avoid it, Cal. And then yeah, somebody yeah. comes in and just really. And then you gotta screen cap that. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I, mean, I can't I, screen I, cap all the madness I see every day. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I joke a lot about being watched and probably being on a list, but you know, like you said, though, a, a lot of us are actually a lot more boring, um, and I I don't think they're wasting their time because you know. If, if if any of people like us, if we're being watched after a while, they realize, hey, wait a minute, these other guys aren't ad openly advocating violence. They're not trying to violently overthrow the government. Like, you know, what you know, what justification do they? Not? Well, I'm sure they can come up with a justification, but <laughs> we are we are boring because we're you know consistent, and that's right. You know, well, they haven't fucked with the guy, the ghost gunner guy, and he's like openly came out and said he's an anarchist. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, so th that way you can, you have a uh, preventative measures to prevent uh, <coughs> uh, provocateurs, for example, from <coughs> and they start talking about, hey, let's go blow up this building, let's go murder this guy. It's like, whoa, 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 get the fuck out of here, you know? Go, you know, your local political party is that way, right? <laughs> uh, and th and that that saves the organization from, you know, from the measures being bastardized or taken elsewhere, uh, which just happens the case over and over again. Uh, so as long as uh, it's the message is clear and well defined, no one can infiltrate and uh, take it in any other direction unless they be ousted, right? If I were for myself to run as a slave master, uh, that would go against the non-political organization that is Liberty or, VA, or the position that is anarchy, right? Anarchy is not a political position, so that would out me out as a liar, as a coward, as uh, someone who's trying to commit fraud and deceive you into thinking that politics will set you free. No factual evidence to back that up. Thousands of years of people trying to do that. With Sanders Spooner trying to do that, to no achievement in those ends. Uh, you're not going to sway the minds of the sociopaths. They're, they want to rule. That's their position. That's why they're there. Um, I think it's a waste of time and effort to seek those people out and try to change them as they were, persuade them otherwise. Uh, work on everyone else that's not a violent sociopath, and that's you know, a large 90% or more of that population around you. Yes. Yeah, so well, it's funny. It's funny you said that because I was actually going to ask that before because you're talking about you know building the community down there and you know the the goal of you know five to ten percent um, of 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 the population. But you you're not you're not going the route of trying to change the system from in from like say the Free State Project for example, who thinks they're going to you know obtain their liberty by going through the state to destroy the state. Um, well, that's not true. The Free State Project explicitly outlines on the website that they are for a, a watch nightman state. Oh. The maximum amount of uh, involvement governments will have in your life is the uh, production of security, law, and order. So, it's, so and, I, and I take the Jeffrey Tucker stance on this. The first three things that should be abolished from government is courts, <laughs> cops, <laughs> <Yeah>. and military. <laughs> that's the first three things that should go. Right. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah. the Night's uh, Watchman state is the most tyrannical state. <laughs> Once they have that, what else do they need? Right. Exactly. They can say, oh, well, we need social welfare programs for our military and our police officers. And, oh, we got a, a Air Force now. Oh, and we got, you know, so it's, right. no. So, well, yeah, we've, we've achieved a lot of success without compromising our principles for politics. Uh, that's how you do that through politics. You have to lie, you have to deceive, you commit fraud, you go through the whole ring of um, being everything that uh, anarchists stand against. Right? I'm not going to lie to someone and tell them otherwise that, yeah, politics is going to set you free and I have no factual evidence to back that up. I'll never tell my brother that he needs a slave master. Right? Uh, I think that's a horrible thing that someone can do to someone, to, to lie to them, to deceive them otherwise. Um, the Libertarian Party has had their chance. Since 1971, they've been around now for decades. Here in Richmond, there's one person who garnered about, Sarvis garnered about 7% of the vote, 7%. After, what, two, three decades, 40 years? That is not a measure of success. At that rate, I will surely die a tax slave. And so, yeah, that's there's no measure of success in that involvement. Uh, let's try something that's never been done before and go all the way 
and be consistent with our principles and our moral values and take the real anarchist, I mean, that not real, I mean, that is the anarchist position. It is anti-political, it is anti-slave masters. Uh, it fits even in entomology, right? Without political rulers, not sometimes if, if, if the political ruler is my friend or if I'm the political ruler, if I'm running for that slave master position on that throne of tyranny, it means without and especially against those that advocate for such positions. Uh, now you're just continuing the lie. Now you're continuing the fraud that politics will set you free, that voting will set you free, that I will be your slave master to bring you that freedom. Nobody can bring you that, right? Now, now, now you're tricking people into having that mindset that you're trying to, to abolish and help them get rid of, that you need slave masters to begin with, that someone who's going to lord over you, kiss the ring, bend the knee, <laughs> I'll bring your freedom. Yeah. And I'll be, I'll be your freedom. Yeah. It's like, and I always tell people it's not, it's not going to be a big, uh, Oh, Hey, we're all anarchists. Now we're going to overthrow the government. It's not ever going to be like that. It, it, it starts with you and what you do. And if that's like you in Richmond, you're affecting and changing so many lives being there. And it starts just from you putting this effort in. Yeah. It right. starts with one person. I uh, just have the courage to go out there and just do it. Right. You have the information, you have the knowledge. Uh, if, you're, if you're at a restaurant and you know how to perform the Heimlich maneuver and you see someone choking, do you turn the other way, do you turn the other cheek to continue eating your meal and pretend nothing's happening, or do you do something about it? Right. Eventually, at the end of all this, when, when it does collapse, people remember those that could have done something but chose not to. Right. Chose to, to just to hide. Right. Or run away. Yeah. That's 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 a good point. I mean, that's it's funny that I that's actually the, the justification I've. Well, I've continued to use for whatever I do to stick my neck out there, because um, a lot of people, you know, just people, people in general, but especially people directly in my life, have questioned why I do some of the things that I do, um, and you know, because I have kids and I, sh I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be putting certain things at risk. And you know, I, I thought about this for a long time, and I, I've sa I've said it before that. You know, do I do I want to end up in a cage? Do I want to end up on the wrong end of a police, you know, gun? <laughs> no, um, but I also I need to be able to look my kids in the in the eye at some point and say, listen, I didn't just talk about this stuff. I was out there trying to really affect change. I was really, you know, I was out there just trying to convince other people not not to have them follow me, but just to you know examine things with an objective eye and say, okay. What, do you, what, what conclusions do you draw from this? You know, just get the message out there. Just get people thinking instead of sitting back and, and saying, well, well yeah, I, I know this stuff and I'm going to teach it to you, but that's as far as I'm going to go. Because to me, it just, you know, I mean, I've said before, I, I don't fault people that aren't willing to go, take that extra step. But there's a big part of me that says, you know, how honest are you really being if you're not willing to go out there and not only just live it, but try to encourage others to do the same like if you're just you're how is that not passing the buck essentially and hoping that somebody else will do it for you um you know it's like oh i i, I have the information but like you said that that heim that, that heimlich analogy is a great one it's like are you going to try to help save the rest of the world or are you going to keep that knowledge to yourself and say yeah somebody else will get it it's all good all right so. There is no, there is no somebody else. <laughs> there is nobody you're waiting for. There's nobody out there. It's you. It's you. The moment you think that, you're the person that you're waiting for. You're the person that needs to go out there and do it. Uh, you're the person who needs to be proactive because the rest around you have been conditioned to not take initiative. The rest around you has been conditioned through the indoctrination camps to look for authoritative figures to do the initiative, to be proactive. They say sometimes the worst thing you can do if you're involved in a car accident or you're lying out there in the, in the mess of your own blood in the streets is to be surrounded by people because nobody's going to take initiative. But the very first time that once somebody does and starts telling people, look, you seek help, you go for bandages, people start following, people start doing that. Uh, and that's that goes to, I guess, violent parenting, indoctrinations of thousands of hours to for you not to take initiative to wait and ask permission until someone else tells you what to do. Um, so if you can break free from that, do it, because everyone else can't on their own unless they're waiting for someone else to take that initiative. You're, you, that's, who, that's, that's who's gonna start this. That's yeah, who's gonna like the, the other, it might just, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. The other day, maybe about 
six months ago, I'm driving down the road and a lady sw coming the other way swerved and went off the road. I slammed my brakes on to not get hit and she went off literally like off like at least a 12 to 14 foot drop and hit her car into a tree. I pulled over, stopped, got her out of her car, turned her car off, got her up out of the, the smoking car, called 911, waited for them to come and then left. And she was like, thank you. And I could have just kept driving. So, I mean, that, you, like you said, you're, it's only you, you have to make these choices. Right. And a lot of people would have kept on driving. Uh, the, inc the incident I described is something that happened to Kitty Janice happened in New York City somewhere in which people are hearing a scream outside their apartments. They look out there to see this girl being attacked. People going out there say, hey, knock that off. And the, the attacker fled. And she picks her, picks her stuff up and she's walking towards the apartment. She gets attacked again by the same guy. People go outside their apartments yelling at her. Say, hey, they're all assuming that someone's calling 911. They're all assuming that help is on the way. None of them has taken the initiative to actually find help for this girl or go out there to check on her. They think that someone else is going to check on her. Um, eventually it happened for the third time. He came back after he ran away and she was murdered right there on the front doorsteps of the apartment. Um, nobody called for help. Nobody went out there to check on her. People assumed that someone else was doing it. No one took initiative. No one was proactive there. Yeah. yeah you, have, you have to do something. You have to act. Well, that's because it, it's funny. I heard, I, I think I made a meme about this a while ago because I, I heard it was, it was something I heard them talking about on the Freedom Fiends. But it's it's the idea that um, it's it's the whole, you know, the somebody must, the somebody should do something mentality of most people. And most and, and those same people don't realize that they're somebody. But it's just and it, and it stems. It seems to have gotten worse since the, you know, the the advent of the participation trophy generations where just more and more people just naturally assume that somebody else should be there to do something for them or somebody should do something um, at all times. You know, the, the, you know, the generations of people now that, that look, to go, look to the state to fix a problem because there's, there's an issue. Well, somebody should do something, and it doesn't matter what they do. As long as they do something, a good majority of people will, will clap and go, yay, they did something, all right. It's like, well, what did they do? I don't know, but they did something. But that's that mentality that so many people have. And, and I mean, that, that story, I remember that story, the one you were talking about, but, you know, just everybody just assumes. They just, oh, somebody's doing it. Somebody must be doing it, you know. Whereas, I don't know, I can remember maybe 20 years ago. That's when I first started cell phone. Um, like in, when everybody was first starting to carry cell phones regularly. Um, and, uh, Back then, it was more like something happened. Everybody wanted to be on their phone, so everybody would call, and, the, and, the, and they would be like, "Over the, you know, something happened," and 911 would be overloaded by like 50 calls from the same incident. Now it's just like everybody's so wrapped up in their own world, and with this mentality of, "Well, somebody either should or somebody will," that they don't have have to think about it, and and it's it's so much easier too because you can just pet, you know, it's that you can with that collective, you could just collectively not take any responsibility for most things that happen by just saying oh well somebody else is taking care of it or you know i don't have to think about this because i'll let other people take care of this or or hope that somebody will take care of this and then um, i absolve myself it's all good i have right. nothing to do with it I, th I think when people start or stop saying so somebody should do something uh, and they start saying i will do something I, I think that's a beautiful transition, and I think more people should realize that you need to be in the I'm going to do stuff. I want to be the change I want to see. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, there's also, uh, it's kind of planned in a way, incidentally. So, for example, if you are forced to pay for security, even though they don't provide it, it's, there's no constitutional obligation or duty to do so. You have the illusion that security is there, or you have, uh, you've been misled into believing the lie that you'll be provided security. So, of course, it removes sometimes this uh, responsibility, thinking, well, I'm forced to pay for this service anyway, so I'm sure they're going to come and get to it. Same thing in Germany, right? There's no real interest in helping the poor because a lot of the money is still in an exorbitant amount from taxation to help the poor. So why should I can throw you a dollar? It's already taken from me. I have no responsibility. I have no interest in helping you, right? So I feel like maybe perhaps uh, that, that that part of the state 
uh, monopoly kind of tricks people into believing that they don't have responsibility also. Um, believing in the illusion that you are protected. You know, this is your Mad Max world. This is your post-apocalypse. There is no security. It does not exist. And that kind of, I guess, dangerous um, acceptance uh, otherwise uh, leads to a lot of these dangerous situations that we come to find. Um, relying on something that is not there. And so, of course, yeah, people will feel like, uh, well, it's taken care of, have no responsibility until they're told the truth. It, uh, there's nothing there to take care of anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah, security. yeah. Yeah, you hear like, uh, well, we need the EPA because the environment would just go to shit without it. And it's like, hey, do you know exactly who the world's largest polluter is? Right. And they're like, oh, I don't know, probably, I don't know, probably like Monsanto. Or it's like, no, it's the United States Navy. Do you think the EPA is just going to go run roughshod and ramp it over the, e over the Navy? No, apparently you don't know how governments work. See, the Navy has this budget, and the EPA has this budget, and the Navy goes, fuck off, and then the EPA goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So, well, you know, these people think, oh, something's going to get done. No, it's not. Government doesn't fix problems. They figure out how to just sustain the Band-Aid. That is it. That's all government does. Well, that's because an organization, well, a, an organization like the EPA was would, would never – their their job is not to go after other factions of the government. Of course, you know, it's it's to go after it's to go after you know the the common person and 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 whoever the the enemy de jour is of the day. You know the, the well, whatever rich, regulations so. the big corporations put out so the other ones can get shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. But you know, most people. It's it, well. It's funny. I mean, you could go you can go on a whole line of questioning with so many people like that. You know, why why do you need you know even beyond. Who, who is actually the biggest polluter? It's like, why, why do you need the EPA? Well, to protect the environment. Well, okay, if you want to talk about, you know, to say like a constitutionalist or even just any average, you know, American statist who believes in, to some extent in the system, it's like, okay, well, doesn't each state have its own version of the EPA? Well, yeah, but so why do you need this bigger one? It's like that, that these are the questions and it, you see, you, you just, I, I see so often people's minds short circuit when they get to a certain point. Because you don't want to make that extra leap because when you, you know, going back to that fear we talked about before, you know, when you get to that certain point, it's like all of a sudden you have to start thinking, crap, is, is everything I know a lie? Wait a minute. That can't be right. Like, because <laughs> I don't know. Again, you know, I, I, I try a scary not... proposition to, to ponder if everything you know is a lie. It is. I, I, I mean, I went, I, I, like I said, I, I always try to draw my own experience and I, I look at myself and I go, you know, I always... I always thought I was a pretty smart person, you know, I had like a, you know, a pretty high IQ or whatever. And, and I, I, you know, I, I always thought I was logical, um, but I was I, I was very humbled when I first stumbled, when I first stumbled into anarchy and realized that I knew even I knew a hell of a lot less than I even could have imagined knowing. Um, but so many people, you know, I remember for me, it was scary. And it was like, and I really, I felt stupid for a while. I felt, I felt really stupid. <laughs> and uh, it took a while for me to get over that. So I understand why people run and hide. It just, it gets frustrating, you know, sometimes when it's like, okay, I, I was, I was really, really blind to this stuff. And I put it together in pretty short, you know, from the time I first heard the word voluntarist to the time I started openly calling myself one was like, I think eight months tops, you know. It was like probably about a, a day and a half for me. Yeah. Well, but I, but again, I, that's why I look at other people. I, I fought really hard. I, I clung to that military thing, that, that, that all important. Well, you, there's no way you could do national defense. And I hung on to that one as, as much as I possibly could. And I'm not even former member like military or anything. I was just, I was that adamant that I, that was the one thing well, that I. It was fear. Yeah. That's what it was, and, and it, and, you know, it was, it was a, I was afraid to let go, and now fear leads to anger, young Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get. Speaking of that, I have a. Uh, do you guys watch the Star Wars movie yet? No, I have not seen the new one yet. No. I don't. I don't care for Star Wars. Sue me. Uh, I don't. I don't care. <laughs> no, I was trying to figure out. Uh, like, there's trying to say Anakin was um, had an immaculate conception, right? He was born from the midi chlorians. Mm. Do you remember that? Uh, Anakin had no father. Uh, you guys watched the first one, the the horrible Phantom Menace one. Yeah, see, I don't. I watched all three of that. I watched that 
part of the you know the series. And I watched them. I don't only, remember only much. Once, only once each, and I was so terribly disappointed that I I don't I try to block them out. So, but I think I I, vague, I remember I vaguely remember that. Yes. Right. So I, I came up with a I guess the solution for that. I, the reason that uh, she thinks that there was no father. I imagine there was at some point in time, Anakin's mother actually came across uh, a Force user, and realized that he knocked her up, did a Jedi mind trick, and said, you know, I'm not your baby's daddy, and, uh, <laughs> and forced her to think that there was no father, and Anakin <laughs> was born purely from the midi-chlorians. Um, only kind of logical uh, explanation for that. That's funny. <laughs> or it could be so, Qui-Gon, right? Qui-Gon knew exactly where to go, uh, yeah. where this kid was, where his uh, parents was. Maybe he just came Well, that would have to be a Sith. Because the Jedi at that time were kind of a look. I don't want to get into it. No, no, no. The Jedi, I, I, I pretended to hate Star Wars. Okay. We're not the. We're not the. I um, do know a shit ton about Star Wars. Look, the Jedi's Jedi. are like benevolent, like cult, like brainwashed people. Okay. Wow. Right, which is why the Jedi <coughs> realizing he made a mistake. Would that no, that would make like that. that would make him like that. That would lead him towards the path of the dark side. So it had to be a Sith. Well, then it doesn't even have to be a Jedi. Or a Sith. It could just be someone who's in tune with the Force. And right. there are people, and they're, they're called gray users or something like that. All right, all right. Good. Unaffiliated good from the See, Sith. See, I don't, I don't know that much about Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I know about the gray people. I know about Boba Fett. Right. Yeah, Anyways, yeah. Uh, we were going to talk about a few books that we would suggest to anybody. I don't know if we've ever done, like, an official suggestion of a book. But um, Jeremy, Cal, you guys want to go first? Maybe two or three books that, like, you say... You got to read this book. This is the best book. Nothing like a clean second way, Dave. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, I'm a master. Um, well, we, we, we were discussing this, I think, a little bit before the show. Um, and Kyle said that I think you said that you had a very short list. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, there, there's so much stuff out there. I, I'm somebody who, you know, for, for myself, I tried to pick like a I came across a bunch of authors that people kept saying, oh, you should read this, you should read this. I was like, all right, I'll read like one book from each to start off with and see where it gets me and just try to like, you know, um, I, I find shorter, you know, most people have very horrible attention spans. So, I mean, I guess it depends like I don't know what you're recommending. I mean, for people to start out with, um, you know, little things like, uh, you know, it's, well, it's not even a book, the collection of essays, No Treason by, by Spooner. Um, Lysander Spooner that that's a great you know for me that was something that opened my eyes um, I think the first thing by Rothbard I read was you know what has government done to your money done to our money um, that's a great little book um, you know it talks about you know it gets a it's a pretty you know I mean you, you could take it to the next step to uh, Hazlitt's uh, economics in one lesson um, to go even further but you know stuff like that for, for people that may think that are interested in liberty or you know, um, even something is, I, I, I still, I, I like uh, Kokesh's book, Freedom. Um, you know, I, I, th I thought he did a pretty good job take, you know, taking a lot, put a, putting a lot of information in a very, very short, um, you know, it's, less than 100 pages. It's basically the For a New Liberty by Murray Rothbard for dummies. Like, that's what Adam Kokesh's Freedom book is. And I asked him that, and he said yes. So, oh, yeah. well, yeah, there, there you go. Cause that's so like, cause if you read them, it, they're basically the same book. Just one is like, it's going to take you a while to read. And the other one's a hundred pages well, that's for, something, for dummies, uh, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would say well, uh, condensed or cliff notes. I don't know for yeah. dummies. I mean, it's just a really toned down, simple. I love that book. I, I have a copy somewhere around here, but I love that book. Cool, guys. Uh, well, you already listed some of the ones I uh, would say. Economics in One Lesson, uh, No Treason, uh, The Constitution of No Authority. These from a Sanders Spooner. And I don't know, um, The Fountainhead uh, is a good one. Um, you can do some by uh, Dostoevsky, Notes from Underground. Um, and I would say that's about it. I'm, I'm writing my own, so that'll probably be done in a year and a half, uh, mostly to 
prepare any person out there to, if they encounter any kind of arguments and how to accurately and good defensively pr uh, protect your position and uh, take it on, I guess, on the aggressive point of that. Um, so I guess my problem, I guess, with a lot of the other books that have been mentioned is the uh, the solution that they propose. And generally, all of them kind of bring about some kind of political solution again. So yeah. I, I think we know, yeah, good stuff, good information. And then it gets to that part. It's like, oh, here we go again. Uh, and of course, these come from people who have not done anything towards um, kind of that kind of outreach. Uh, these are people who've done a lot of circle jerk uh, conventions within, you know, people who already are in the and view everyone else as monkeys, like uh, Doug Casey, for example. Uh, they can't get it. Or people will say, only one person out of 10,000 people can understand this. And so they've already made the position that they've given up on their community. To advocate for politics means you've given up on thinking that your neighbor can understand this. Because uh, all you have to do is just pull a lever and hide in a confession booth. So there's no community involvement in there. There's an abandonment. There's an explicit admission of that. And so whenever I come across that stuff, like, I can't recommend that to anyone. Um, and a lot of the information is very easy to, to talk about anyways. Uh, so, you know, there's some good books, you know, just, um, just a lot of, I guess, misleading, confusing stuff, though, you know, that I could never really uh, advocate for or endorse. Um, so for that reason, uh, yeah, Lysander Spooner, I think he's got a lot of legit stuff there. I mean, he fills in uh, his understanding of uh, IP stuff, but that's uh, was ahead of his time, him trying to still kind of battle that area. Yeah, no one writing an IP law could envision what the current situation is. There's no way. Right, right, right. Uh, so I mean, that, that'd be his only, uh, I guess, Lysander Spooner's uh, failing, <laughs> if you want to say that. Hmm. Uh, that and, of course, his, um, his plant frontier in trying to uh, sway the minds of violent sociopaths, right? He sort of just focused the rest of his attention to his community instead and helped them find that kind of reason and virtue, um, not from these monsters who need it most. And so that's, that's usually my quip about these kinds of books that are out there. Um, and which is why I guess it's kind of forced me to have to write my own book <laughs> and to kind of be consistent with these principles. And so that way there's nothing misleading or lying to you about politics setting you free. And uh, we'll see how far uh, that gets us. Yeah, if I, I mean, the three books I would probably suggest to anybody to read, Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose, Freedom by Adam Kokesh, and How to Win Friends and Influence Others by Dale Carnegie. That's probably be my three books. If I if I was if I was gonna tell someone to read, well, I I, I get well, uh, I I I love it. I've never actually read that book. You you say that you mention that one all the time, Dave. I should probably read that one of these days. Um, but I, I get what you're saying about the the type of the type of books with the the solution, and and that's actually that was actually the, one of the few one of the criticisms I did have about freedom was the the whole you know peaceful dissolution of, of the, you know, using the state to dissolve the state type of thing. Um, but that goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about, you know, doing it from the ground up rather, which is the, the approach I, that you guys are taking. I, I, I like that approach a lot more. Yeah, if, if you're going to tell um, me you can dissolve uh, a federal political gang, it's like, please, the largest political gang out there in existence, show me first how you can dissolve your local political gangs. That's yeah. not, that's not his goal with the campaign and well, running. That's, well, that's, 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 well, that's no, what is. I see is that he's advocating for a slave master tradition and he wants other one other people to bend the knee for him, right? That's a dime a dozen. That's not a unique tradition. That's everybody else trying to do the same thing. Uh, I don't no. care about their intentions. I don't have I don't have a magic crystal ball to let me know whether finally you have the good intentions. They were, we're, we're in this hell because... No, no, no. Like, hey, I mean, uh, it's... One, one more thing. When someone says... Uh, the only thing I have to rely on, if you're going to call yourself an anarchist, is that you advocate against political rules. You advocate against slave masters. Not that you want to be one yourself, right? If you're going to, same thing if you're an atheist, and you call yourself an atheist, but you go on to, you perform the same rituals as you would as a religious person. You go to church, you, you do your prayer beats, you go to the confession booth, uh, you kneel, you sit, you stand up, continue and over, so I'm going to call you a liar. Right, I'm not, I don't have time to follow you around and see whether or not. Oh, he has good intentions. It's like, sorry, you know, that's. I'm, I'm not going to stick around. I only have the actions in what you tell me or what you show me. The actions, what you show me as an anarchist, or otherwise, or I see fraud, I'm trying to lie to people again. The politics set you free, and that's a dime a dozen. We're here today because of that. I would not call someone an anarchist who does an advocate for Rand Paul. I'll call you a liar, a status in denial. <laughs> actions over words, man. I, Correct. I, hear you. Yeah. I make that argument all the time. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think, well, I mean, I, I, he, I think he is right though, Dave, that actually is the, it's the whole idea of, you know, dissolve it, going localization and going from the, trying to dissolve the top down, but it, it definitely, it, ne it never made sense to me. And it, it make, you know, it makes more sense to start smaller and go upward. And cause again, you know, you, if you convince people, if you could convince people to dissolve the federal government, then everything should fall right away. But that's like that doesn't seem possible at all. <laughs> um, it, it's much, it's much. I, I, I think the solution that's inevitable. I mean, you look at the USSR when it collapsed economically, you look at the Eastern states of uh, Europe, they dissolve peacefully. That's inevitable. Yeah, that's, what it, yeah, that's, that, that's inevitable. That's, that's not, that's not a big deal. That's inevitably going to happen. Uh, what happens after that? Right. Do we continue repeating? Well, we got here because we want a slave master. So I guess let's keep doing the same thing. Well, yeah, right? well, exactly. The matrix. Well, yeah, exactly. It's, it's if, if, the, I, I, if, the mind, if the mindset changes by the next time that happens, then yes, then we can. Here's here's forward. the thing. He I don't he doesn't want to win the election. He's using it to uh, as a propaganda thing. Which I, I yeah, you know, that's what I I'm glad he's doing that. But to be a troll, great, great. Dime a dozen. Well, again, I don't have time to know what your intentions are. I'm here to educate. Well, I don't I don't I don't give a shit. All I have is what you're doing, what you're showing. All I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't uh, be talking to you right now if it wasn't for Adam Kokesh. I gotta be real. That's honest. great, that's great. Oh, good, so. good for you. Uh, we have over hundred people here in Richmond that didn't come through politics and didn't have to be lied to and telling them that politics was set them free. All right, none of them came along. I mean, maybe that's small, I've never really took that seriously. Like that. That's it. Six years living here, five people. That's not. I, I think that's, if you believe that's a lie that goes out there, and people are telling, you, oh, all oh, these anarchists, they're run Paul creators. Like, where are they? <laughs> Online, yeah, separately out there, and and this, and this different isolated areas all over the country. Where's the community? I don't see that. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's 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 tough. It's tough to get everybody organized. You know, everybody's got you know lives like, and stuff. It's, well, it's tough. Get there if you're lying to them through politics. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, it is tough, but I think you know, Cal, Cal's. You know, there, he's out there proving that it can be done. You just got to be willing to put the work in, and a lot. You know, I'm 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 guilty of that. I I, I talk a lot about stuff, and I, I I do half of what I say I want to do. Um, but if but if you know you want to make it happen, you got to get out there and do it. And it's not, you know, I, I think I think what you're saying though is is true. Is that they're they're the people that are out there. They're they're still isolated and they're not doing anything about it. So. Um, it's much better. I mean, I mean, heck, if you're writing your own book, I'm, I'm, I'll look forward to reading that because, uh, you know, I, I think you're right. I think a lot of people do. It's a, a na I, I don't know if it's just to sell more copies or it's just a natural inclination to fall back on having to have some answer or some type of solution to give people. Um, and so many people end up falling back on the political one anyway, after all the talk about freedom and liberty, which is kind of scary. Um, right. but you, you gotta get, you, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things like, I, I, I often say that you don't, I don't have to have the answers for a lot of these things. Cause you don't, in order to make the moral argument, you don't have to have this, you don't have to have another solution. You just have to know which, what action is immoral and you don't, you know, you want to stay away from that. Um, so you don't have to have the answers for like the, what if this, or, and how do you handle this? It's like, well, no. Okay we do it without the course of force that is currently being used. Um, after that, the options are open. Right. Um, yeah, right, exactly. Um, I, but, I'm... but it's, but I, I was just going to say, but I, on the, on, but on the flip side of that, I also, um, I understand where a lot of people are hesitant without, without having answers. So in, on, in some instances you have to be able to show them, you have to, not that you have, but it, it makes it easier if you can give them, you know, just, visible proof that hey this is how it functions without it this is how i'm able to do this you know like that it goes back to what i said earlier about what i do with my business and how i try to teach people that way and just say hey you know it makes it a little bit tougher in some instances but it can be done right now if i can do it right now with all these hurdles in my way imagine what i could do without them you know and that's just little old me with my little old business here in new york you know you know it's, what imagine what anybody else could do without the with somebody with even a, a better drive um, more capital to start off than I do, <laughs> and uh, you know, and 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 more and a little more time without the hurdles. Imagine what they could do. Right. Yeah. So. But you know, to 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 bounce back on 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 to what what we were talking about with Kokesh, you know, I I I'm not I at, at this point in the game, I am a advocate for attacking at all angles. Desperation, nice. 
It's not necessarily desperation. It's attack at all angles. Like. No, I'm, I'm seeing it. Desperation. A thousand cuts, man. Uh, no, I see desperation. Uh, how many anarchists live near you? Near me? Yeah. Maybe four or five. Four or five. Okay, so your relation of successors are four or five near you, which is why you seek to desperate solutions. Right? Um, uh, no, I don't say I, I seek my own solutions, Cal. Like, I'm just saying if somebody else is motivated to spread the message of freedom, I'm not going to I'm not going to kick them off their their milk carton. That's all I'm saying is is, no, is I'm, I'm not, that I'm is not. detriment. That that's a <laughs> that's taking a step back. Mick, kick him off the milk. I mean, I'm not out here. I'm here to do, do my own thing. All right. I, I see me a lot too. Of people so doing like, a lot of uh, spreading lies and telling people bullshit and telling them that you need a slave master. Um, now I'm not going to spend most of my time trying to call those people out. It's like the best way I could show otherwise is to do it myself. All right. There's people who believe that you cannot achieve pre freedom, that you cannot talk to people about this sort of stuff. And so I'm out there to show otherwise that you can, right? I think well, you do a great job of it, man. You, you, your message, the way you do things, man, is great. And you're growing your, your community. And I, anyway, <laughs> and I, I, anyone can do this. Uh, I, I know they can. I, I, and, and I think that you are not, I, I don't want to say like making a template for this, but I, I think that you are really at the forefront of this, go to a city, start building stuff up start spreading the message locally you know internet is one thing but this is local like actual people you can talk to and have relationships with in a physical manner you know not like anything like that but you're just physical you know like going to have a drink with another anarchist going to be able to just hey you want to come over and watch a movie it's just that really helps a lot and uh, a lot of people don't have that you know they feel like a pimple on a, a face you know <laughs> Right, right. Um, but I guess the, the pragmatist approach, and that, that's, that's been tried over and over again, right? Uh, people, like you mentioned, like Kokesh, is dime a dozen. I heard his president, his advocation for the throne of tyranny several years ago, and that's all I needed to hear. I don't really keep up with any of this stuff. I mean, that's, that's great. That you can just, like, just write these people off. I don't have time for that, right? Everyone's trying to advocate for the, for the throne of tyranny. You have even incomes doing the same thing. You have oh, an income here in Richmond advocating for the throne of tyranny. And of course, when they go out there talking about anarchy, that's what people are going to associate. Well, it's a political thing. Well, I guess you can have slave masters. Well, I guess you can be political about it. Oh, so there's no longer a distinction between the two. Now you've, com you've done the same thing what government has done in trying to confuse people with the language and the words. And I think that's a horrible thing, a horrible thing you could do to a person. So I'm not here. To, to I like think everyone things. approaches how to, you know, put the Legos together or how to fix a problem differently. And, you know, we all have our ways that we think uh, sure, is, is but, correct. But then, and have no problem calling yourself a status if you support slave masters. Have no problem. Take pride uh, in that. Oh, no, uh, no, no. no. I, I, I completely anarchy, agree with you on that. Anarchy means without uh, political rulers, without slave masters, right? If you're going to call yourself an anarchist, be consistent regardless of their popularity, regardless of who they are. Right, have some principles. Don't don't compromise your principles for politics. Correct. Right? Uh, and and then from there, it doesn't have a prescription and on how to free yourself from the cage. That's true. That's what we need to figure out. That's what we're trying to do and figure out. Well, but I think that, I think technology is going to allow that to happen ever more increasingly. You're, you have, you know, if all kinds of stuff coming down the pipeline that is just going to be able to, like the government, it just can't keep up at this point. Think about it. What are they doing? The Uber comes out, and now there's cities that are saying, "No, you got to give taxis a chance because Uber is too fast." So, I, I don't know about technology. I mean, te government would use the same technology against you, right? Uh, they, they will, but they do. the uh, hive mind is always better yeah, than the Eli government. Whitney's, Eli Whitney's machine thought that it was going to help end slavery. It exacerbated it, right? You know, you, you find that a lot of states would use the same technology to kind of exact to uh, expedite their their own ends at your expense as well. Um, you know, I find, uh, you know, everything the NSA has uh, adopted in terms of the, the kinds of software that they used came from the market. And they didn't really invent anything. Um, yeah, you have dinosaurs in there. That's true. Uh, it is difficult for them to catch up, but I think it's the, the moral principles, the moral values that pave the way for the technology to catch up and to align them in where we wanted to go. Uh, without that pavement, without paving the way with the, these moral principles, anyone can use this technology and to achieve and encourage their own means and ends, which generally means hurting people. Yeah, well, it's, it, well, it, it's I, I say that a lot. It's a technology is a double-edged sword. You know, it's it could be, you know, it could be quote unquote our great savior. It could, you know, it's also the bane of our existence at some point because exactly what you said. It, until 
the until the foundations of the the the, the, the you know the average individual are changed it's, <coughs> it's so much easier to get swayed towards I guess, you know the dark side <laughs> right yeah uh, i mean pizza hut wants to deliver pizzas using drones government wants to use drones to murder people overseas and and and, and, and weddings and uh and children Yep. Yeah, I think so. I'll take the pizza. <laughs> well, yeah, most, I don't. I don't want a drone bomb. I want a pizza. Well, most people would say they would, but then they would also a, a, a lot of those same people would still find a way to justify the use of the of the of the other use of the drones, and that's the that's the mindset we have to change. Right, bombing um, Agrabah, for example. Yeah. Exactly. Oh god. Oh my god. Didn't that just make you just want to give up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it makes me want to give up. It makes me want to like go build the compound and just just hide out for the apocalypse, man. <laughs> right. But the organization that put that policy pull together is a leftist organization, so they're out there trying to make look, Republicans look as uh, demonic and, and cruel. They didn't really ask some of the same questions uh, to the Democrats uh, in, in that defense. So, yeah, uh, it makes it, and of course, sometimes they'll throw in uh, these random questions just to make sure that you're listening and following. So, uh, yeah, you can't really take a lot of those polls that comes from uh, Would you bomb Agrabah? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> would you bomb insert place you don't know where is on the map? So, yeah, I'd do it. <laughs> Bomb yeah. them out. Well, Agrabah well, is actually uh, the name of the city that you actually lived in before we changed the name. So right. <laughs> we're going to be bombing you tomorrow. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no. That, but uh, let's, I guess let's wrap it up. You know, let's have a good Christmas. Uh, well, it'll be closer to New Year's when this comes out. But uh, you got any Christmas plans for the uh, RVA group? Yeah, we have a secret Krampus uh, thing going on. So, like, oh, like sweet! <laughs> That's, I'm so jealous that, you, that it isn't Liberate Birmingham, and you're not down here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could, I could, I could see me and you really getting into some really good arguments. If you guys ever find your way up here, let me know. You guys have plenty of place here for you guys to crash. Well, uh, if you ever come down to the south and you need to sleep on a couch, you call me. Roger that, buddy. <laughs> Dave, Dave, Dave doesn't. Dave doesn't want to leave Bama. He's uh, kind of. I, I. I would like to leave New York. I'm just never allowed to between my kids and my business. But right, right, right. Dave, Dave I can't. We can't get Dave to go anywhere. Oh hell no. <laughs> no, my girlfriend's like, we should go to France, and and, and I'm like, no. <laughs> he's, he's, he's been branded by his state. I mean, that's just. Uh, I got held down and branded. Yeah, so. I, I mean, like. <laughs> He's uh, he takes pride in his. Uh, hey, look, look! I have never, ever, never claimed to not be a redneck ever. <laughs> I've never, I've never said I ain't no redneck. All right, ever. There we go. So. <laughs> redneck and proud. <laughs> no, I, 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 you, you are what you are. A duck's a duck, you know. <laughs> I don't like people that like to sit around and pretend that they're what they're not. I love genuine people. That's my favorite thing. Is just people that are genuine. So. I find I find you very genuine, Cal, and I, I find your message and the way you approach things very very solid. And uh, I've only, I've only found myself disagreeing with you a few things on some things. I can't really recall them, but I remember me going, "Wow, I've rarely disagree with Cal," and this is one one time. So you do you do a good job, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's it's great uh, to always catch up with uh, fellow anarchists, fellow champion of liberty uh, from New York to Alabama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, Sadly, well, Ben is down, way down south Alabama somewhere doing his thing. So there's at least two of us that, I don't yeah, know. So you, yeah, look at that. He's, you, you have another, you, you, you have another anarchist you know in the state. You won't even go see him. Yet. <laughs> it's like five hours. <laughs> Gee, I could be halfway to Richmond. Uh, uh, <laughs> see, well, you, but that's what I'm saying. You won't go anywhere. But anyway, <laughs> all right. So, so yeah. We're, we're going to, we're plotting and scheming like a Seeds of Liberty Fest. We might just fucking have to do it in Richmond and just have everybody come there and let's just have a big thing and set it up and go camping and have a bunch of speakers and stuff. That would be fun. Very, um, yes. Very ambitious, Dave. I can, I'm, I'm lucky if I can get you to organize an episode every week. Much as the whole festival. And, you know, that. I've been right. just. Uh, but, uh, yeah. We, yeah, let's uh, let's kind of wrap it up, Cal. Cal? It was, uh, Oh, Cal, I, I, this wasn't really an interview, but I like to ask everybody that's fresh on the show, what's your favorite quote of all time before we end the, end the show? Uh, I'd rather be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring the ridicule of others, rather than to be false and to incur my own abhorrence. I believe that's uh, Frederick 
Frederick Douglass. I found that quote in DC on a sidewalk payment that he wrote. Um, and it, uh, it talks about integrity. Uh, I think another one would be, but well, I'd rather you hate me for who I am than love me for who I'm not. <laughs> that's a, yeah, I, I, that's what I tell people all the time. They're like, I hate that Dave. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dave. You either hate me or you love me. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> So, thank you but, guys so much for having me on, um, dude. I appreciate you, you coming on guys. such such. Yeah. I, I appreciate you coming on such short short notice, and I hate that Danilo wasn't here, but I really appreciate you uh, coming on and talking to us for a little while. And I hope you have a really good Christmas uh, with all your your family and friends down there. And I hope everyone else uh, had a good Christmas by the time they listen to this. I hope everyone had a good Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, yes. guys, and bah humbug. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's that's me. I, Happy Marijuana Konzica. I, I am the I am the curmudgeon of the group, um, right. but yes. Yeah, so it was it was great talking to you, Cal. Thanks a lot again for coming on. Uh, we'll uh, put li links to all your stuff in the show notes. Um, this has been the Seeds of Liberty, uh, episode forty-one. Um, you know, as always, if you can uh, like, share, subscribe, uh, you know, comment on any of our content wherever you may see it. Really appreciate that. Um, just trying to spread the message. Uh, all of our stuff can be found at theseedsofliberty.com. And uh, we will catch you next time. Peace. <laughs>